if you look at technology as a, uh, a factor in um, changing the way that we think about copyright and changing the way that the laws um, are made and experienced, it, it has an influence, but surprisingly, I think it has less of an influence than other people might think. You know, I'm not much of a technological determinist. I think technology's put it on the agenda, but I think really um, what's going to be more significant, at least within a capitalist society, is uh, how these uh, innovations affect the market, and then in a, uh, in a, in a more sort of uh, artistic and philosophical sense, what people are actually doing. So, for example, you know, you have people like Negative Land who've had an immense influence in terms of shifting the cultural perception of, of rights and wrongs, so to speak, but um, they've had you know, absolutely no effect on the broad market per se. They've removed a certain amount of pressure from artists. My sense of technology is that it opens up a whole new palette of possibilities, but most of these possibilities don't ever get, uh, don't ever have much effect in society. Look at Bruce Sterling and, you know, the list of uh, hundreds is it thousands of dead media platforms. Much of what we're looking at today as potentially revolutionary and emancipating is going to end up dead media. Um, the, the bigger patterns, you know, I, I remember when I was a Voyager author and I was making CD-ROMs, you had all this serious discourse from, you know, artists and arts administrators with fancy haircuts looking at give it straight face with a straight face talking about CD-ROM as a new artistic medium. Just like in the UK they used to talk about teletext, you know, as a medium unto itself with its own, um, you know, way of, of massaging the content that it, it, it carried. And yes, that's true, but um, I think it's more that technology opens up a vision of possibilities, but people tend to be very, very choosy about what they pull off that menu. Mm -hmm. I will say with regard to technological determinism that it exists and um, you know we can't argue that the telephone changed the world we can't argue that the internet changed the world I frankly think that the telephone still casts a larger shadow on the world than the internet has to this point although the internet's rapidly catching up um, but these are very very long cycles um, so I don't know what file sharing tells us yet about the cultural economy I don't know what rip, mix, burn, and all the things that you can extrapolate from that very simple uh, menu of actions tells us about the way that people are going to be expressing themselves in 2020 and 2030. It could be that we have another generation of people that just watch movies and sit on the couch, except that they're fancier, more immersive movies. We don't know yet. Um, what I think we need to do is to um, uh, is to be a little more provisional about the kind of regimes we set up. In other words, with the, the, that we don't build digital rights management that lasts for decades, that we don't set rules for uh, emerging technology that uh, tend to cut off its potential from the very beginning, you know, or if those rules exist that we don't accept them. So with regard to copyright, the first thing I'd say is that there have been a number of historical periods where copyright gets foregrounded. I mean, you could talk about the French Revolution, you know, in periods of, of time when uh, copyright is used to enforce uh, social ends and social control. Um, but in my lifetime, uh, copyright became a big topic of conversation in the 70s when we revised the Copyright Act in the United States. That's when you suddenly start seeing copyright notices all over the place. In recent um, years, there have been a few catalysts for, you know, kind of a hugely increased consciousness of what copyright's all about. The Eldred case, where Eric Eldred um, sued to, uh, to overturn um, term extension in the United States and lost. A lot of people got a sense that copyright was an issue to be concerned about. File sharing and the prosecution of little kids and grandparents and ordinary people, um, big issue. DRM is going to um, foreground copyright as a consumer issue. I think that's already started. I think people are far too concerned about copyright, actually. Um, I think we need to be aware of it, and I think we, should, uh, we shouldn't be passive. But on the other hand, um, the problem is that we're all thinking about copyright to the point that it paralyzes us. 
Um, you know, copyright used to be the province of lawyers and maybe a few geeks. And in many, many ways, I'd like to see us a little less concerned about copyright and a little more concerned about culture and access. Um, most of the decisions about the copyright regime under which we're going to live have already been made by large copyright holders, by the culture industry, um, and it's their turf. We can't really play effectively on their turf. We have to be reactive. And this is, is no way to run a culture. We cannot continue to react to other people's rules. It leaves us no um, latitude to lay out what kind of a world we'd like to live in. I think we need to have a broad conversation. It's probably going to be an international conversation where people who make things and people who use things, I'm talking about cultural works, uh, sit together and think about what kinds of um, uh, rules best serve uh, these interests. And I don't know that we're going to agree, um, but I think we need to ask a little bit more about utopia. We need to ask a little bit more of utopia. We need to really figure out what kind of a world we'd like to live in and then try to craft regulations to match that. Being reactive doesn't cut it. The big problem isn't going to be the copyright law. Uh, for most people that make culture, it's going to be access to the original work. You know, if you are trying to do something about music, how do you get access to the performances that you need? If you're doing a historical piece on the civil rights movement in the United States, how do you get access to stuff that's in the archive that hasn't already been aired? That's going to be the issue. Copyright, in many cases, is going to be the secondary issue. Um, I think that uh, a lot of the um, conflict, the so-called copyright wars, have resulted from you know these poorly articulated business models. The publishing industry has been freaked out. The recording industry has been freaked out. The movie industry has been freaked out. The suits don't know how to think about this. But there's a generational shift. There's a notion that some of these um, you know newer ways of uh, of of marketing and exchanging cultural objects actually turn out to be more profitable for their owners than you know I, I think we're kind of the extremism is is uh, is starting to fade away a little bit and we have to think about what's a little more sustainable and I think we need to figure out what the rules should be ourselves we can't let the Hollywood or or, or lawyers or the US government figure it out for us we should do it ourselves A lot of people valorize the 60s. In the 60s, there was hardly any independent media. There were three television networks in the United States. You had the BBC and the ITV. Um, there was hardly any underground press. There was, of course, no blogs, no, uh, no websites, uh, a few obscure zines, mostly in the literary and political world that nobody saw. Um, this is a rich and exciting time to be alive, and it's precisely because of cultural proliferation and the absence of rules, the absence of permission. Um, I don't think that's going to go away, even if it's you know a million blackboards scratched with a, a rock, you know, when the electricity goes off. I don't think that's going to go away.